All right, now please to join me is none other than BYU head coach Mark Pope, uh, who is currently uh, basking in the WCC, but soon to be headed to the Big 12. First of all, before we get onto your team, um, what's it like headed to the, the Big 12 at some point soon? Well, listen, on the, on the, uh, the couple weeks leading up to it and then the day of the announcement, it, it's, it's, it is – it is such an epic move for us. It's hard to put into words. I mean, not only are you moving into the best basketball conference in the country, and I know you have your allegiances, whatever, but, I mean, find me a metric that doesn't agree right now. The last six, seven years has been the best basketball conference in the country. But also, for us, we're actually, for the first time, moving out of this exclusive West Coast time zone. We're actually playing a bunch of games that are like Eastern Standard Time, right? I can, so, I can stay awake for these games now. Yes. So the exposure is unbelievable, and uh, the challenge is off the charts. And as a, as, a, as a athlete and as a coach, you dream about being put in the most difficult possible scenario. And th- this is it for us. It, it just – we're so excited. So the, it, it's been unbelievable. Our fans are losing their minds because for the last 10 years, I kid you not, like we have sports station on BYU TV. So it's a – nationwide one hour like our version of sports center yep i'm saying 85 percent of the time on that every single day show for the last 10 years they've been talking about us getting into a conference so <laughs> so now you're there we'll see if they're happy in a few years or not you know fans the definition of fans is fanatic so they're going to be happy and they're going to be unhappy and that's just the beauty of it just hey it's it's less sleep for you and the other thing, hey, maybe Alex Marcello can can be like a 28-year-old by the time you go into the Big 12. Maybe he'll still have eligibility. No, I, I kid you not. The day of the announcement, Alex and Tizan Lucas both walked into my office like, okay, so we we, we used COVID. What are we going to use this year? How are we going to extend this thing out? All right, let's get to your team this year. And, and we'll start there with your two uh, gray-bearded uh, backcourt mates, one who's been there for a few years, one that is a newcomer. Uh, Barcelo uses the COVID year to get another year back. How important is it to have him back, leadership, elite shooter, and, and has really been a great player for, for your program? Yeah, it's um, when he, you know, it, it was all of us went through something different that we've never gone through last year after the COVID season because recruiting these super seniors is a super delicate process. It's probably unlike any other recruiting process we've gone through because you feel so indebted to these young men and so sensitive to trying to figure out what is genuinely best for them with like this history. Normally when you're recruiting, you don't have this massive long history, but like we've been working on this project for so long and, um, so it was, it was, uh, you know, it was just, um, it was, a, it was really fun and, and uh, gratifying process. And then, and then, you know, when he decided that the best thing for him was to come back, of course, Cougar Nation lost their minds. We're all so excited. And I'm excited. I've never won a game at BYU without Alex Barcelo. So I'm super grateful he's back. And he's, he's, he is one of, I don't know what, six all Americans that are returning to college basketball. So he's in really elite air. He's actually, the number one three-point shooter in the entire country over the last two years. If you average out, he's clearly number one. That's crazy. Uh, he was our floor general and leader last year, um, and he's led us to kind of back-to-back top 25, you know, single-digit NCAA seed year. So uh, clearly it's important to have him back. So he can shoot it from anywhere over half oh. the court. And, and you honestly, like you won't even yell at nothing. He can do nah. it. Well, he part of the agreement was that I was not allowed to say anything to him all season long. So he just rolls into the gym, does what he wants, and rolls out, and I got to take it. Just like you had it at Kentucky. <laughs> that, yeah, <laughs> Coach B. Coach B wasn't listening to a lot of words that I said. No doubt. No doubt. All right. Uh, Lucas, kid that, that I actually talked to through the recruiting process a lot, and I don't know if people realize, like, Kansas was interested. Like, the big boys were really interested. I don't want to say you lucked out, yep. but you did luck out a little bit by being able to add somebody of his caliber, another versatile guard who scores it, yep. he rebounds well for his position, and he can make plays for others. Tell me how you envision those guys playing together. 
Well, uh, I can't say enough about T. John Lucas. So it's interesting with the recruiting was, you know, we've talked about this a lot. So my first phone call to him was like, hey, here's the deal, bro. I know I know how you played and, uh, you know, I know the ball's in your hands all the time. And, and you, you know, is, is your last year, you might be looking for like a stat stuff a year. Yeah. I was like, that's, that's not what we have here. We got a returning All-American point guard. Uh, we got a really good roster. We we win because of how we play and how we attack this game. A hundred percent sure that he was just going to hang up. He didn't. This kid did not. And that's because of what he cares about and who he is as a human being. And also he, he, that he wants to take a shot to do something incredible. So he is he is a he is a playmaking savant. Like his joy factor in this game, which he got so much joy and so much competitiveness, but like it comes from from making plays, right? He doesn't have to be the finish all the time, although he's fully capable of dropping 30, right? But he just wants to make a team better on the offensive and defensive end. We were just on uh we're kind of bouncing around the league. You know, we love analytics, right? So we were on with an NBA team with their analytics crew a couple of days ago, and they're like, well, Tejan Lucas popped us two, two, two years ago because he was just filling up every single statistical yeah. category in a special way. And, uh, and all, you take all that and set aside, and the joy he walks into the gym with every day, man, everybody wants to be around this cat. Yeah. So. Yeah. Those two guys in the backcourt together is really dangerous, and, and it's going to make me look like a good coach. Uh, Seneca Knight. So played three years at San Jose, um, briefly put his name in the portal, and I, I think spent like a day at LSU and then decided <laughs> to withdraw from the portal, and now he, he's, yeah. he's in Provo. Um, is he eligible right away? Do we know? And, and obviously he's a guy that put up great numbers a couple of years ago. I think he averaged like – didn't he average like 16, 17 a game? Yeah. 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 He's um, so he's played a ton of division one minutes and he's been a lead dog on on teams and and uh you know he scored a lot of points and he's actually I actually I, I know he can score. I'm so excited about his playmaking ability. I mean, he's six six and long, um, but is really explosive and really physical off the bounce. So right now, so you know, we charted our last 10 workouts and he's a 1.416 points per possession pick and roll ball handler derived offense. That's insane. Like he's a 1.2 points per possession as a pick and roll ball handler, but his derived offensive numbers are so high. This, this is a guy that I could play a lot at the four and I could play at some one, like I play at some one and, 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 you know, he's, you know, at San Jose state, they use him a ton in high ball screens. Um, He's really bought in, like he's really worked on his condition the last couple of months. And uh, again, he's got so much joy. We, you talk about lucking out. We really lucked out getting this young man. He, he's special. He's going to be great for us. Two really good transfers. Yeah. Um, but I, I think the guy, okay, tell me if I'm wrong here. The guy I'm kind of the most intrigued with this year is, is Caleb. And, yep. and, and a jump that he can make, I don't know, I just think, Listen, he, he rebounded so well as a freshman, way better than I thought he would. Um, scored it well enough, and, and the way he scores it, again, you're talking about versatile guys, right? That's what the NBA is all about. That's what college is all about now. We've already talked about Alex, uh, Tejan, and, and Seneca. You add Caleb to the mix, and you're one through four. And we haven't even gotten to Gideon here. It's yeah. pretty strong. Yeah, so Caleb is, I mean, for anybody that hasn't seen him, he is, if you've ever been and seen the statue of the, the statue of David, like he literally with his haircut, he does. He does. He is ex like it. I can't tell if he's the cartoon Hercules or he's the statue of David or some kind of like. He looks like a young Jeff Goodman. That's what he. There I mean, you go. Exactly. Just like hey, just just <laughs> I got the same lock, the same. So this this young man, man, how special is he? Like. His game right now, I can tell you where he's gone this summer. So he was an extraordinary rebounder last year, averaged over seven a game in, 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 you know, somewhat inconsistent minutes, just in terms of like, that's how every rookie is. Um, he shot 50% from the three point line in conference last year. Uh, and, and his defense has actually taken a massive step forward. He is, if, if Caleb Lohner, um, grows into a lead, lead role on this team, we're going to be, we're, we're a problem. 
right? We're a problem. And, and you know, with young guys. Is that what it, you want, Mark? Is he too passive in a way? Is he too too nice or no? No, no, he's not passive. He's a, he's a, he's tough as nails. Right. He is. Uh, but listen, you know, the game comes at you so fast, right? And so I actually have him. And the thing is, I'm asking so much of him. I'm I'm trying to play him at the five and the four and the three, right? And so for a young guy having to learn so many different positions, especially the way we play where our fours and a lot of times our fives are decision makers on offense. And then three is four to three is such a big transition. We're just like pounding him with information. And he's got way more comfortable making reads on the court. Um, but that's going to be a determining factor for him because he's going to elevate his game as a rebounder. He's going to be an unbelievable – like he might be one of the top defenders in the country. Um, and, and, and his decision-making in real time, the way we play, is going to be probably the thing that dictates how quickly he grows. But obviously we're super excited about it. And another guy with potential. I mean, Gideon, you know, first year coming in from JUCO – a lot of people know his background, his story. Amazing, amazing kid. Everything I've been told about him is off the charts as a human being. And again, athletic, long, talented, you know, just started to scratch the surface really last year for you guys. Yeah, he's, um, you know, he, for us, it, like in my history with junior college players, you take some three or four months of the season before they finally kind of get used to the pace and physicality of, of high level division one basketball. Um, but you know, he had, he had some incredible standout performances for us last year. I mean, he essentially won us the, the St. John's game, which was a huge game for our season. Right. And, um, and really complicated circumstances and then had some incredible performances jumped in the starting lineup. The last third of the season has had a, a, a off season where he's working really hard. He's actually moving, you know, it sounds crazy because he was, He's so long, but his mobility's increased a lot over the summer. Uh, I love where he's going right now. And he gives us length. Like that middle of our roster right now is super interesting. That potential two, three, four. You know, you got a lot of guys that are six, seven, six, eight, six, nine long, where we're hoping it'll give us some versatility on defense and offense. So the big question, I think, correct me if I'm wrong here, is probably in the middle, probably your fives, only because health really with 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 Gavin Baxter he's only played like nine games over the last couple of years uh Harward's been solid how do you envision that playing out is Baxter healthy do you think he'll be able to give you some quality minutes this year or do you play Caleb more at the five well we we, we actually have a lot like a, a lot the one thing about moving the Caleb to the five is it lets us squeeze in more of that length at the three four and two um but but I think it'll be by committee. Rich Harwood is a proven, durable, just a – and he he would actually appreciate that I'm using this word. He's a thug on the court, meaning he just loves to make contact with everybody. So, like, yeah. if there's nobody on the court and he walks into an empty gym, he'll just start running against the backstop, right? He just wants to hit somebody. And uh, he, he's been gr- – he had a great year for us last year. And then Gavin – you know, Gavin is going to make it through this season. We're going to be super cautious with his minutes, but he gives us a dimension that is just so unique. And then we have two young guys, two rookies, that I think both these guys are going to hopefully find a way to see the floor. Uh, this Fus Traore is yep. – he is – he is – if you, you remember Yoli Childs, physically and length, He's those dimensions, right? And so Yoli was an undersized four or five in college, um, but he was so explosive off the floor and had this incredible touch and sense for the game and used his body so well. And Foose has got that giant chest and the seven two wingspan, and really? he's really explosive off the floor. He's just a rookie, yeah. Yeah. but he could help us. And then it's a Tiki Ali Atiki is uh is he's gonna be super easy, man. Like this dude, when it's all said and done, is going to be a great, great player. It's just a rookie. So we'll see. Those four guys, you know, we need them to hold down the five spot, and they will. They're actually working really well together. You had such a great year two years ago, such a ridiculous year before COVID hit. Um, is it crazy to say that this team could be as good, if not better? I mean, you were like 24 and eight, you 13 and three. You were great in, in the league. Um, could this team, I mean, I just feel like, you know, again, your top five or six year experience, they're versatile, you know, they're athletic, like you've got a little bit of everything there. Yeah, we have a chance, you know, I mean, 
it's interesting about where we are right now is is we piece this together. So year one, we had such a different roster than year two. Like year year two, we I mean we finished top twenty five last year too, but we were so big and so deep. Year one, we were so little and we were so skilled and we had no depth. And year three, we're definitely not as big as we were last year, but we do have great depth. And I think our skill level is really, really improved. It's, I, I don't know where we're going to finish. I do know that this is going to be a fun team to coach and a fun team to play. And, and these guys have brought so much energy and commitment into summer and fall workouts. I think we have a chance to be really special. I think we have a chance to be really special. What's your biggest concern? Um, well, a couple, you know, my biggest concern is, are we actually going to be what I think we are? We've spent the whole summer working on our decision making, right? Okay. And one of the things that we took a major step, you know, even though our team was probably almost equally successful year one to two, we did it different. We did it with size and depth and, and the skill level wasn't quite there, which is hard to do. I mean, you got three all time greats, right? That first year. And so we spent all summer working on decision making our guys ability to kind of kind of kind of read what's happening the way we do it. And so I'm hoping we've made great strides if we have on feel really good. And then the second thing that's got me a little bit is, you know, exactly what you diagnosed, what's going to be our health and growth at the five spot? How good are we going to be there? Yeah. All right. Before I let you go, give me your, your I know you're a turkey sandwich guy. Give me your sandwich rankings. Yes. You mean of all time? Yeah. What are your, I mean, your go-to, is it turkey every day? Like, what are we at? Yeah. Well, here's the thing. I'm turkey every day, every single day, except if I'm feeling a little sleepy, I can't do turkey, man. I got to do something spicy, right? Some with a little bit of hot, I'll put some hot sauce on there just to, just to wake me up, right? But turkey is my go-to. I'm telling you, anybody, man, when you roll through here, just come to the office. I will whip you up the greatest turkey sandwich ever. So I don't get it. You have like, like, do you have like a deli counter in your office with like a, a, a you know, like they do it at, at the supermarket when they, they they do the whole thing of turkey there? Yeah, we got the whole like BYU Strong Nutrition Center going on. And I'm, it, it, but first of all, it's not just the ingredients. It's the love that you put into the sandwich. You should know that being a Northeast oh, guy, man. Listen, I'm all about it. I'm all about it for the Italian. I'll throw some, a lot of hots on there, every oil and mayo. I mean, oh, it's not on. healthy. It's not healthy, but it tastes good. <laughs> well, hey, there's a difference between healthy for your body and healthy for your soul. That's man. right. The Italian, hey, it makes me feel better. That's all that matters, right? That's right. All right, Mark Pope, I uh, appreciate it. Good luck this season, and uh, we'll talk soon. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate you, man. You got it, man. Before we move on, let me tell you guys a little bit about our partners over at Bet River Sportsbook. If you haven't signed up for Bet Rivers yet, now is the time because they are offering a $250 match bonus for your first deposit. But what sets them apart is that they require just one playthrough to turn your bonus into cash money. With their rush pay instant approval, withdrawing your winnings is safer, it's more secure, and it's more reliable. Now that basketball season is tipping off, get in on the action at betrivers.com today or by downloading the BetRivers iOS app. You must be 21 years or older. If you have a gambling problem, call 1-800-GAMBLER. And while I got you here, let's talk about the Field of 68 Media Network, where college basketball matters most all year round. This is a digital media and podcast network that we've been building over the course of the last year. We have shows hosted by some of your favorite players covering the program that they love the most. AJ Guyton hosts the House of Hoosier. Eric Devendorf covers Syracuse on the scorer's table. Dan Dickow hosts the Gonzaga Bulldog broadcast. We have Florida's Patrick Young and Duke's Andre Dawkins and North Carolina's Shimon Williams and Michigan's Stu Douglas and Illinois' Deion Thomas. The list goes on and on and on. We have more than 30 shows right now. So hit the links below and check them all out. And while you're at it, make sure that you go check out the Field of 12 Media Network, your home for college football. All right, that was BYU head coach Mark Pope, and now it's time to talk a little bit more Cougs, and uh, we bring on two guys who know this program and this team well. And, and first, we start with Greg Rubel, uh, who actually is the play-by-play -play guy uh, for BYU, and Sean Paul, who's a rising star in the business, uh, co-host of Making the Madness podcast, will also be a contributor to the Field of 68 
uh, this year. So thanks for joining me, guys. And let's get right to it, Greg. All right. So, you know, listen, they, they bring back Barcelo, which is obviously great news. Uh, they bring in a transfer, uh, Tijon Lucas, who's experienced as well. Do you think this team can be better than Mark Pope's first two teams in, in Provo? Well, I guess short answer, yes. And, and, and the longer answer is better while being different than either of those two teams, which I think is Mark's, you know, the, the beauty of Mark Pope's coaching is that he can really have three different, you know, combinations, looks and feels. And I think endeavor to get the same kind of result from all three teams. Last year's team was very different from the first one he had, yet they were very efficient, uh, a great effective field goal percentage. They did it different ways. The first team was all three-point shooting and almost no offensive rebounding. Second team, a lot better on the boards, a little less on the three-point shooting, but not terrible by any stretch, just different that way. And, and again, I think you've got a different feel for this group as well. Again, not maybe as much length as last year, but maybe maybe more versatile length in which you could see a team switching one to five, one through five. And, and not every team has the ability to do that. BYU could be one of those teams this year. So, yeah, I, I think it's encouraging to think about, even though you lose a Matt Harms and Brandon Averett, uh, who are talented players, you can still be good, if not better than last year. And I do think that new dynamic duo of, of Barcelo and Lucas in the backcourt will be the real strength, a real strength of this team. Sean, can this BYU program push Gonzaga at all in the WCC? Or is it clearly Gonzaga, no matter what, and BYU, where do they fit in? Yeah, I think it's clearly Gonzaga just because of how well-rounded the team is. Obviously, Mark Few, what he's built there is incredible year after year. They're just far and away the number one team in the country for me. They were the number one team for 99.9% .9 of last season before they had a rough game against Baylor. Drew Timmy is a preseason national player of the year. They just have everything working for them, a top five recruiting class. But that's not to say BYU won't be a really good team. They are a really good team. Like you said, return Alex Barcelo. Tejon Lucas played big minutes at Milwaukee last season, averaged 14 points, five assists. And Gideon George is a really versatile defender. He has a wingspan over seven foot. And one of the big things about Gideon last year, there was a tight game against St. Mary's. St. Mary's was up eight going into just under 10 minutes they switched Gideon George on to Tommy Cousy St. Mary's point guard and that really changed the complexion of the game and for a 6-6 wing to be able to defend one of the you know more savvy point guards in the WCC and change that game entirely really shows his defensive versatility he's that kind of guy that can defend anybody on the floor with his athleticism and his length but the big question for me about this team is probably how they're going to replace Matt Harms. They'll have to rely on freshman Fus Traore and Atiki Ali Atiki to hopefully step into that role that Matt Harms leaves because he was an outstanding defensive piece for this team. Yeah, and Greg, you know, I just talked to Mark Pope, and, and one of the things he was hoping for is, is that Gavin Baxter will be healthier. You know, he's not going to give him extended minutes. We know that. But can he give him 12, 15 quality minutes and you can play different ways. Obviously, Caleb Warner played some five, and you can, you know, that is the beauty of this team, right? It's versatility where he really didn't have that either of the first two years. You know, it's a little bit out of sight, out of mind, Jeff, with uh, with Gavin, because I, he he is as jumpy a player as I've ever seen at BYU. And while he he doesn't have Matt Harms' height, he can get as high as Matt Harms. I, I think in, in the ability to get around the rim and 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 be a factor that way. We just haven't seen him do much. It was a shoulder two years ago. It's a knee last year. A full season of Gavin Baxter with some seasoning um, will, I think, be really impressive and, and I think should be able to make an impact, even though his dimensions aren't that of Matt Harms. He can have a similar, if not similar, a, a, an approximate impact for the kind of things Mark Pope wants him to do around the rim. And so one of the things I'm most excited to see is just how Gavin Baxter looks. He's changed his jersey number. Kind of an out with the old, in with the, in with the new, hoping for some better luck that way. And, and maybe it'll be a different uh, a different feel on the floor as well. And we haven't talked about Caleb Lohner yet, but uh, uh, Caleb him. is a guy that is big enough to see some time at the five. Um, but he, he's as comfortable guarding a three as a four, as a five, and could be on the wing. He could put him on a two and, and feel like Caleb's going to be able to compete there athletically. He's a really exciting young player as well. And, and there are too many guys that look kind of like the way he does, especially coming in as a freshman last year, really developed physically. And I think uh, the, the basketball IQ just came along game by game last year with him. Yeah, I love Loner. And another guy we haven't talked about, Sean, 
a kid that was in the portal for about four <clears throat> minutes uh, and went to LSU for, I don't, I don't know, he was there for a day, maybe <laughs> Seneca Knight uh, ends up at, at BYU and very underrated. When, when you talk about all the, the transfer ads throughout the country, everybody's going to look at Lucas and, and rightfully so, because I think he's going to have a major impact on this program. But Seneca Knight can really help <clears throat> this team, can he? Oh, yeah, big time. I mean, he was a 17-point-per-game scorer at San Jose State two years ago. And given that was not a very good San Jose State team, but he was relied upon to do everything. And now he brings a 6'7 frame, good athleticism. If you leave him open, he could hit a shot. And he's really good at getting the foul line, a little versatile, uh, versatile defensively. Again, that shows the versatility of this team. Like Greg mentioned, you could go with a small ball lineup at certain times. Like, let's say you're playing a Gonzaga. And you know Drew Timmy's going to score no matter who's defending him. That's just what he does. You can go Loner at the five, Gideon George at the four, Seneca Knight or Trevin Nell at the three because Trevin Nell's a lights out shooter, and then go with Barcelo and Lucas as your two guards. And I think that's a lineup that could very well compete if the big men situation uh, with Baxter, Harvard, uh, Treore, and Atiki don't figure itself out right away. They could pivot to a smaller lineup and go with a more offensive scheme to try to win that way. And I think Seneca Knight could be a real underrated piece for this team he's not going to score 17 a game but can he score eight or nine maybe 10 a game and play in big minutes i could see it down the stretch for sure because he's that kind of score yeah it just gives him veteran right like they, they've got enough veterans now guys who have produced you know uh, enough up and down the lineup i i think that can help greg when when dave rose retired i, I think everybody was a little bit concerned you know it, it had started to fall off a little bit at the end with dave uh anyway but you know, the next hire was going to be important, right? And, and you know, you're talking about a few guys at that point. They go with Mark Pope. I, I thought it was a grand slam hire. I, I did. I, I think Mark Pope is a star coach. What, what's been the reaction of him around there? I, I mean, his personality also, like he can connect with people. That's one of the biggest things that I think his personality compared to Dave Rose's is, is kind of like night and day, isn't it? Well, they're certainly different guys, but but each guy was um, a, a broadcaster's dream and maybe a writer's dream too in in, in their own ways, right? Uh, but the way Mark does it is with just such gregariousness and affability, and and he's outgoing and he's he's excited and he's genuine and he's happy and like he's a little all kid. these things. It's like it's, a little yeah, kid. Yeah, it, it, it's really a contagious thing and it's a real thing, right? Um, I, I I've been doing this for a long time at BYU, and so I was with. Uh, Coach Rose's staff from the get-go, and I was able to see Mark Pope come in the first time as an assistant. And and Mark, too, one of, the, one of the great things about Mark is Mark Pope then with BYU is not Mark Pope now because it wasn't his program then. It was Dave's program. And and Mark really was in the background. And and and, and Mark Mark wasn't having to be uh, the same kind of uh, you know presence that he is now. That's Dave's program. And Mark did his job. Mark Mark learned. Uh, Mark adapted. Mark uh, grew as a coach when he went to UVU. Then you see it more to come out. Now it's his program, and you see that Mark Pope begin to really emerge. And then when he returns to BYU, you get full Pope. You're peak Pope now, and 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 it's going really well. Obviously, through two years, and I, I think it's a beautiful thing too that that Dave, you know, brought Mark in, uh, and and then Mark leaves to to kind of spread his own wings, and he comes back. And the timing was such that when Dave was done. Mark was ready. He was he was you know moving up, and I think I think BYU's fortunate they got him when they did. Uh, quite frankly, and now you add to that the fact that you know BYU can now claim P five membership or Big Six membership if you want to go to a basketball standpoint here within a couple of years, and and maybe there's you know less incentive for a coach like like Coach Pope to say, well, I need to get to the next. He's even be at the next level in a lot of ways. You know what I'm saying? No, that, that's a thousand percent right because you're thinking. You know, again, Arizona kind of – they didn't go after him hard, but he was in the mix a little bit there in the periphery uh, at Arizona. And you're thinking to yourself, well, if they're staying in the WCC, why wouldn't Mark Pope go to Arizona? Well, now if you're talking about them, them being in the Big 12, Sean, you could keep Mark Pope because he does fit BYU so well. Everything that, that he stands for, obviously, he fits. Now he doesn't have to leave. He could be a lifer. Um, at BYU, because again, you know, now you're playing in a big boy league. 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, joining the Big 12 was huge in keeping Mark Pope because his name was going to continue popping up in every coaching search that opened up because he's that good of a coach. And, you know, why would he leave for, you know, a school like Cal or Washington when you're in the Big 12 with BYU and you're already at a better program? There's just no reason to do it. And moving up to the Big 12 really helped keep Mark Pope around for the long term, I feel like. No doubt. Uh, Greg, how do you think they're going to fare in the in, in the Big 12? Like, do you, I know Mark's excited. We talked to him a little while ago about it. And, you know, again, Pope is Pope. He's just so out there and doesn't hide his emotions. And, you know, in one on one hand, it'll be great because they can probably recruit at an even higher level, you know, selling kids if they're going to be right. playing, you know, Kansas and uh, some of these really good programs in the Big 12. On the other hand, the competition's better from top to bottom. You know, it's funny because for a long time, uh, when talking about uh, the WCC and what BYU is dealing with at the top of the WCC, I said what you basically have is Kansas in the WCC in the form of Gonzaga, a league, a team that runs the league and has for years and years and years and years. And now they get dropped into the league I used to reference when when talking about the giant at the top, even though it's evened up a little bit and Kansas come back to the pack, maybe a smidge. It's still the same kind of vibe where it's that hard to win that league. Uh, and that's the big thing is is. They've been in the league 10 seasons. They'll have two more years in it. They've not won the conference yet. And, and there hasn't been a league BYU's been in that they haven't had at least one championship in that basketball league. And, and, and that's something you really they, they'd like to get done in the next two years. Uh, you know, clearly it's, it's never been a tougher task than now with Gonzaga the way they are. But that's the objective is to leave the WCC leaving a mark. Somehow getting a banner a ring, a title in one way or another, either here or in Las Vegas before you leave this conference. Then when you do go to the Big 12, yes, you go kind of from frying pan into fire, right? Um, and, and you could even use the national title game as an illustration. Gonzaga is so good, so dominant, so hard to beat. And Baylor, look what they did to Gonzaga. And that's your new league now, all right? So that's where BYU is kind of going in this whole thing. But we know that in the Big 12, um, there'll be more beating up uh, mutually amongst teams than there is in the WCC. And such that whereas you're looking for two, maybe three every year, you're looking at five to seven every year bids, that is, in the Big 12. So it's easier to be good, middle of the pack good, and not be on the outside looking in when it comes time for the tournament. Yeah, I don't think they're going to get that WCC title this year with Drew Timmy and Chet Holmgren and uh, Nemhard. But maybe in a year, maybe when, when Holmgren leaves, Timmy leaves, maybe Nemhard leaves, you know, like then – Maybe they can do it in two years, depending on, on Gonzaga's recruiting this year. Uh, Sean, what's your biggest concern with this year's uh, BYU team? What What's kind of the key to them making sure, you know, maybe being a, a consistent top 20 team this season? Yeah, I touched on it a bit earlier, but I think it's going to end up being the five spot. Obviously, Matt Harms was an elite defender. He really helped transform that defensive unit. They were vastly improved on that end last season. Blocked a couple shots per game. 7-3, just a large person, just giant. And then this year, they don't have that. Richard Harward is an okay defender, but he's not that kind of guy that's going to switch on to guards and defend them. Uh, Gavin Baxter, again, will he be healthy? He's really athletic, big wingspan, but hasn't played in a while. And then the two freshmen, Fus Traore and Atiki, Ali Atiki, those two are really the X factors for this team. Whichever one could step up and be that consistent five five man that can defend, block some shots, will wind up changing what BYU is. But if neither of them step up, I think the ceiling is a little bit lower than it would be if one of them takes that step as a freshman. Yeah, I mean, I feel like it's almost so easy to, to pick where they're going to end up in the WCC this year. You know, you, you clearly have Gonzaga up here. St. Mary's isn't nearly as good as they've been. Nobody else I don't think is going to contend with BYU. It's almost like you have Gonzaga, you have BYU, then you have St. Mary's and everybody else. Um, Greg, where, where do you see this team finishing? Maybe not within the league necessarily, but how far, what the potential is for this team in the NCAA tournament? Because I think we all feel like they should and will get there. Yeah, I, I think last year was interesting in that, um, you know, the sixth seed felt not, not overly generous necessarily, but um, maybe a bit of a, a surprise from where maybe people thought they might be at the start of the year, let's say, ending up with the sixth seed. Then when they took that sixth seed and didn't get anything out of it, you know, after that, after that buy, um, it felt like a bit of a letdown. And, and so, you know, getting a step beyond last year, I think would be, you know, objective number one, win a game, advance a bit in the NCAA tournament. Um, and that's, you know, it's a, 
I guess we're saying it's a foregone they're going to get there. It's hard enough to get there. Once you get there, uh, find a way to win a game and, and and move along a little bit. And I think if you're just, you know, if you're the second best team in the WCC, generally speaking, that's good enough to get you in the dance. At least it has been. And everyone kind of expects Gonzaga to be that top with, with BYU right there, as you noted. So, yeah, um, finishing top two, getting to the dance, winning a game. I think those are reasonable expectations. And um, I, if I'm not concerned at all, I'm more curious about how that division of labor will go in the backcourt to start things out. I think T. John and Alex are going to be great together. How they actually play together will be kind of fun to see. And I want to see if anybody that we're not talking about rises up uh, to be a game winner uh, at, at some point this season for BYU. Somebody that uh, you know kind of proves to be a bit of a, uh, an X-factor guy that we didn't see coming. And I, I throw the name Hunter Erickson out there as somebody that could be a guy that uh, didn't get hardly any minutes last year that could see meaningful minutes this year because of how much he's done uh, with his offseason in particular. I, I love Loner. I, I think Loner has a chance to be an absolute star. And if he takes that next step uh, along with Lucas, Barcelo, uh, Gideon, George, I mean, they've got, they've got a lot. And it is, you know, uh, as Sean mentioned earlier, Trevin coming off the bench, uh, you know, gun and shooting threes, They've got a little bit of everything here. And I, I, Sean, where where do you see him? I mean, anything surprising? Again, we've kind of gone through it. Number two in the WCC almost seems like a given. You hate to just write it in with stone, but it, it almost seems like where else could they possibly finish in the league? Yeah, I mean, I, I think they're definitely going to be number two in the league. But, you know, teams like Loyola Marymount, they look like they could be back in the NCAA tournament with Cam Shelton complimenting Eli Scott very well. That'll be a fun team to watch in Stan Johnson's second season. St. Mary's is always consistent. I mean, last year was one of Randy Bennett's worst teams, and they were still good. They still made the NIT. And then San Francisco, Todd Golden's one of the best young coaches in the country. Jamari Boye is a great guard, and they add Ewan Masalski from San Diego, who will provide that post presence that they lost with Jimbo Lull a few years ago. So I think the top five in the conference is very stacked, more more so than other years. I think BYU is above the other three, but I wouldn't be surprised to see you know three bids and maybe a team on the bubble outside looking in. But I could see three bids, whether that's St. Mary's or Loyola Marymount or San Francisco being that third team. I kind of see it being a three-bid league at the moment with BYU being above the other three in the mix. All right, well, there you have it. A uh, full breakdown on BYU from two guys who know it well. Greg, uh, Sean, I appreciate you joining me. And uh, make sure you uh, follow the Field of 68, all our preseason content. We'll have breakdowns of all the top teams, top 50 countdown. Uh, and everything else in the network. So thanks for joining us. We'll see you soon.